Is this the official beginning of the show? Yes, yes. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Montessori Show. It is uh, June, I think, I'm losing track of 2011. <laughs> June 11th. Um, and I'm Simone Davis, joining you from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. My pronouns are she, her, and um, I'm here with my friend Jean Marie Pennell. And I'm Jean Marie Pennell, uh, your parenting mentor, live from San Diego. And just always a pleasure to be here with Simone to, we spent a little bit of time catching up and we started these, what, five years ago, I want to say five years ago. Uh, and, and, you know, they're growing a little bit and it's, it's, we always love your comments where, where we feel that, you know, we're making a little difference in your world and you're making a big difference in ours. So it's always, always nice to be here. And for me, I always get a real pleasure of seeing how wide and international this community is. That's beautiful. Like to see, to see where everybody is calling in from is really great. Um, so today we, uh, we, and we like to choose, you know, a topic to, to start with, to just guide us. It sometimes it goes in all sorts of directions, but uh, for this Montessori show, we wanted to talk about observation. So we did an observation three years ago, and uh, we can relink that one. But um, observation is really an, a very important cornerstone in Montessori education. It is a huge, huge part of our training to become Montessori guides. Uh, as for the three to six, we do a lot of observation and we start with inanimate objects to plants, to animals, to humans. Uh, and it's, it's really about training ourselves to be what Dr. Montessori called to be a scientific observer. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But And then the birth to three, I, I don't know about you, Simone, but 250 hours of observation. And it was, you know, I observed a birth, uh, a newborn in the, in the first hours and, you know, all through uh, little ones in their home, little ones in communities and all of this. And it's really for us to train ourselves to be observers of what is happening in front of us without judgment, without any preconceived ideas, without any personal, uh, because we're gonna interpret it, but we, we try to put our biases, our judgments to really to the side. And, and we actually, <clears throat> and, and I have this in like the courses that I run, we have a, like an observation journal where we actually have a column set aside if we do have a little comment like that of, you know, oh, well, you know, I don't like her dress or whatever. Like you can't, you, you, you have your personal things, but the idea is really to be the scientific observer so that we can really um, guide really the child to, to what the next step might be. If we're observing that they, you know, they keep on going back to the water and turning it on and off, well, we're going to maybe offer a lesson around that or a lesson about, you know, transferring water or, or things like that. So it really helps us um, to be a better guide. But for me, it's also observation is also about observing ourselves, you know, the really being mindful of our own movements, of our own tone of voice, of our, um, of, you know, how our mood, everything like, you know, the observation journal I remember was we had to always start with the weather. <laughs> And, and, and really how we were feeling. Like if we, you know, like today I am observing that I am running on minimal sleep and I am sleep deprived right now. So yeah, it's just that, that, is going, that is going to affect how you see things, how you observe things, how you judge things. So it's important to always be also observing ourselves. And this to me is also important when we look at, um, not only Montessori, but positive discipline, because positive discipline is often 
how we as the 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 adult how we are triggered or how we react to something is often going to tell us what our child is really trying to tell us what is the what is the hidden message behind their their behavior so this is a beautiful practice to to do not only as montessori guys but just you know life itself you know observe when you're waiting to check out at the supermarket or you're waiting for your food or you're just at the park it's like it's part of just being in a moment of mindfulness of just noticing what is around um, without without trying as much as possible without judging it and 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 so forth and that is I think the biggest one and I'm sure Simone you have a lot to add to that but I think that's that to me is 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 just the importance of it is really being a mindful observer of what what's going on. Absolutely. I love that you said without judgment because judgment sneak in. And if you're doing self-observation, you then start to judge yourself being bad at something, you know, and actually it's just like observing my shoulders are really high right now, you know, or I'm feeling um, like I want to do that for them. And it's really nice to be able to write that down so that it stops you from actually doing it. Mm -hmm. um, also, I would like to just say to adults, I, I work with parents and children in my classroom. And so the parents, I say, try and be like a video camera recording this or writing a transcript as if you're going to give it to your partner later of what your child's doing, because then you can't sneak in these little words like, oh, they're just playing with the cars. You know, all the video camera says is they're playing with the cars. And then what's really fun is if their child does play with the vehicles a lot we have a vehicle matching exercise where we have an excavator and an, um, a bulldozer and a front wheel loader and if you don't know what all of those are you'll need to go and look them up and then the pictures to match and things like that and uh, um, the adults often think oh they're just playing with the cars and then they start to see all the small details oh actually they've put all the yellow vehicles together they've sorted them by color this time or they've lined them up in a particular way or um, they are re reminding their parent or their carer of a situation that they saw um, a tram and you know they're so they're starting to collect and put all the information together and they're using language as well as like social skills uh, like so it's so fun to see it's not just vehicles but there's so many aspects of cognitive development happening when they make a match between the two things um, and really add the fun thing that we didn't learn in in my training but I did in a following like observation course that I studied which was that in their training, they'd learn to observe the environment first before you even um, start observing the child. So they spend 20 minutes writing down everything that they see in the environment. And I think that's so powerful because we often talk about what can we change in the environment and ourselves before we try and change the child, right? So then you might notice, yeah, actually, there's quite a lot of clutter. Like, no wonder it's feeling a bit chaotic in here. Right? Or, you know, so you can write down those kind of things, how you can improve it, but also just fact, I mean, not actually making any assumptions right now, but just write it down. And then you can, in that right hand column, maybe write down things you want to change or the analysis. But yeah, I think that that kind of gets us started anyway. And I love that when parents um, or carers, they go, this is just like um, a mindfulness training, isn't it? And you say, it, it is. basically it is. is. In yes. the present moment and seeing what's in, um, in front of us. Mm. Oh yeah, one last thing, because we often write down what we think we're seeing as opposed to what we are seeing. So for example, a bit like the video camera I was talking about, um, one of the observations that I did last week um we were showing a baby and the baby was using their right hand to hit at something and so someone wrote the baby's using their right hand not their left hand and you're like why do we need to refer to the hand that's not doing anything you just right, what's in front right, of us right, what, not right. what we're expecting so it's, it's tiny tiny but it is like little subtle expectations or um yeah, it's not even a judgment, but it's like you come with a preconceived idea of what you expect the child's going to be doing. And I mean, after over 15 years working in Montessori, I'm in my classroom um, yesterday and there's, I can't stop talking today. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> That's why we're doing this show. There's so many adorable <laughs> Montessori moments. Okay, so we have this tiny little box. Um, it's a beauty, beautiful tin that T once came in and the child needed some help to take it off. So I sat down next to them to show them how we pull this tin lid off. And then they were very, very tiny beads and this child was not very old. So my assumption was they're not going to be able to do this. 
And I, I'm just like, Simone, just see what's in front of you. And then I notice them with very, very accurate skills, pick up the bead, look for where the holes were, move their fingers away from the hole. They couldn't coordinate getting the very, very thin, like, because they'd gone to the very hardest threading activity. Um, and so I did, you know, what we always say, do as little as possible, but as much as necessary. So I held the string for them in the kind of right direction and they got it on. And we did that yeah. a few times and their yeah. concentration kept going. And then I put the string down and it was too hard and they walked away and went, ah, okay, interesting, right? So I was testing to see how much help, am I giving too much help? I was giving just the right amount of help when we ended up breaking concentration. Anyway, so it's really fun to just remind ourselves to keep seeing things with fresh eyes and not yeah. jump in with expectations. And I'll just, I'll just conclude with a quote from my trainer where I trained for as a primary. And she said, observe first, wait second, then act only if you have to. Right. And that's Dr. Dubovoy, where where it's really this idea of and I think this is really helpful for parents, too, because we, 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 we always want to be in there, intervene. But if we step back, um, we we're, we're I think when we intervene, you know, we're kind of stealing the, 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 the moment for our child where they're going to have an aha moment, where they're going to learn, where they might where they might be disappointed or, or such. Uh, you know, just like what you were just talking about, maybe if you had intervened, they wouldn't have had this little, you know, moment of, of turning the bead. So act only if you have to. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. Yes. Um, so I just dropped in the chat, if anyone actually would like to make their own comment on some observations that they've made during this week or um, how they approach their observation, um, we're such a cozy group. It's re you're really welcome to unmute yes, yourself. Yes, unmute yourself and 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 uh, let us know. Um, we'll raise hand or pop it in the chat. And one thing, good. one thing I will say um, that I am really taking great pleasure in these days is that there seems to be more and more parents on Instagram that uh, like film their children in a way of observation. And I know I get great pleasure not having young children around anymore to just observe, to see like, you know, just I, I'm, I'm, I'm observing all these little, little people. So thank you for all of you who do that. Um, and not to forget for the actually write it down though sometimes as well and not just do the video recordings because you do see different things when you actually take the time to get out a notepad and write it down um, and at least and, and the, the notepad out also helps you not intervene because you're doing something yeah absolutely. so that's really important um so do you have some questions i'm trying hey, to i do have, have questions i've got one from yuan so it says, Dear Jean-Marie and Simone, many thanks for all your valuable insights and guidance to make Montessori accessible and attractive, thereby spreading it more and more. Thank you. Um, or us helping shape a better society one child at a time. Oh, that's lovely. For my four-year-old Nicholas, I'd like to ask, what's the best way to observe what activity would be best to introduce at any given moment at home, including not introducing any and letting him on his own, going out and about, having him join errands and having him join household chores, et cetera? That's a good question. That's a, that's a beautiful question. And for me, I would reframe it in that it is observation that is going to help you know what to introduce. It's really about, and when, and when we talk about observation, it's not only what we see, but it's what we hear, what we, the questions that they're asking, the, the, the curiosity that they keep on going back to, that's going to also help us kind of guide them and, and feed that curiosity. So that's where, where um, I would start because um, the best way to observe is to make, make it, a, make it a, a kind of a daily or, or weekly, whatever your time is. And it can be five minutes here, three minutes here. It doesn't have to be maybe, you know, start a little journal or have a pad of paper that you know you can always jot things down. Now we even have our phones. You could even dictate, do, 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 you know, talk to your phone if, if you, if you need to, but it's just about noticing. It's just about noticing what he's interested in, what he's 
keeps on going back to what he keeps on asking for. That to me is always very telling in how we can modify the environment. Because if a child is, is continually asking for something that you realize they could probably get on their own, then, oh, it must not be at the right place for them to be independent, uh, things like that. That's, that's where I would start. And that will guide you in knowing what it is that you could present and, and work with. Yeah, I love that because you're looking at their interests and we're talking about a four-year-old here who is asking a lot, who is communicating a lot. So that's easier. Um, when I do observation, I kind of go through things in my head, like co what cognitive development is happening. So how maybe if it's a child who's four, who's interested in words, you know, they might like to make shopping lists and things like this for making them interested and engaged in that errands so you're looking at are they showing interest in those things or where are they at cognitively um it could be their fine motor and gross motor skills because you know children love heavy objects so they can really be involved with moving the shopping or whatever those kind of things are so we're looking always at um where they're at with their fine motor and their gross motor skills as well and what kind of in things might um interest them going out and about um, I mean, I think it's actually great that you're doing observation and talking about things that, you know, often we're thinking about shelf activities when we think of observation. And I actually really love the question that it's actually some of the bigger picture things. Um, how, and actually, it's kind of almost um, observing on the run, because if I've set up maybe a baking or a cooking activity, I set it up with the idea that they might be able to help wash, but then I might kind of start showing them the cutting and then that goes quite well. So they can do a bit more independently. And so I'm kind of observing as I go when I'm a parent, you know, like, and we are as well in the classroom, but um, definitely as a parent, you, you're you making it up on the, on the spot and just seeing, I'm always kind of like, um, asking a question to see if they're interested, get engaging their interest that way, and then keep following their interests as I go. Um, and then you're looking at language development um, so that I can always see like, oh, where are they at in terms of, so that I can keep choosing books that are gonna keep challenging them because if we don't challenge them, they're gonna challenge us. Um, anyway, there's a whole list of different areas that you can observe, like in the Montessori Toddler. I even have it on my blog post. So I'll actually link to this. I've got a couple of blog posts about observation as well with things that you can observe. So hopefully that helps. And, and Simone, I just want to pick up on when you say as, as parents, we observe on the go, because it's so true. It's like every moment of the day, there's something that you're, you're, you're taking note of. Um, and this, I go back to also what triggers you like there might be there might be some activities that just like ugh, I, I don't you know <laughs> I don't like it or I don't and I think that it's important to to notice that too that that you you know there are no shoulds and oh I should be doing this more of this if there are things that that you're not interested in doing you know don't uh I mean no I I take that back um just notice and and try to understand what what is triggering you so that you can move forward yes. i think that's a really valid point because painting comes up for me painting was not my favorite thing to have out at home because it freaked me out so then okay what could i do to make it less stressful for myself it's okay not to have it out all the time but when i set it out i'm going to have just a small amount of paint um, you know, and I'm going to have exactly. thought through yeah. what to do if there, when there is a spill, because there's going to be a spill. So I've got cloths at the ready. I've got somewhere where to hang it up because in our houses, we often don't have somewhere to hang all these very soggy paintings and then they get over enthusiastic <laughs> um, at all those things. So then it's sometimes just reviewing, okay, that didn't go so well. So yeah, I love that you're reflecting on what comes up for us yeah. as well. Yeah. So um, Jenny and um, Akshatha, I find your name so hard. I'm doing my best. Akshatha. I've, I've got it, Akshatha. <laughs> I've been practicing. <laughs> um, and so uh, is it Jenny? Would you like to unmute yourself and share? Sure. Hi, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful call and background. Uh, I'm on the train, so sorry for the noise. But, um, you know, I followed... Um, Simon's last uh, class uh, and we started writing down and my question is uh, writing down a journal and my question is more like about the process so what I found is uh, you know uh, it's helpful when you write down the observation in terms of thinking through 
um, kind of uh, what's going on, but I never come back to the journal to, to analyze what happened before. So just kind of curious, how do you guys use this as a tool? Is it to, to structure your thinking and to kind of put attention to the flow of mindfulness, or do you also use it as a way to come back and see what happened and, and analyze things in the future? Thanks. So, so, so for me personally, I used it a lot in the classroom, really to, to be, be attentive to what I saw, where were, where were their struggles, where there were challenges, where there was misuse, uh, things like that, which helped me to, to guide me in, 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 you know, being more aware of what they needed, kind of the next lessons, or if there was a part of the presentation that they, you know, that they kept on, on maybe um, not understanding or something that I knew that maybe there was something more that I needed to, to, to add to it. So for me, it, it, it was really about writing what I saw, but I did go back to it to to kind of think through what that could you know how I could help them you know make it make it uh, further and I think it's the same thing at home is like I said you know earlier if, if if your child keeps on asking the same thing and you have that in your journal then you're then you need to at some point go okay so what is it about the environment or what is it about me that I need to maybe improve on or change or, or do differently next time. So it, it, for me, it is important to kind of go back because I think you, you, you see it again differently when you, when you reread yourself. So I, I personally, I would definitely encourage that. I don't know about you, Simone. Yeah, I know, I know that parents may not have time. So maybe a shortcut is at the end of your observation to maybe having that side column or somewhere, this is an action that I wanted to try out, you know, like it's basically an experiment, isn't it? It's like, oh, they're looking like they're interested in their buttons because they were having trouble getting their buttons. So maybe I could do like a button presentation and um, where you really slow it down. And there's actually like three major steps, like opening it, pushing the button through, and then getting it into the spot where normally it just looks like that, you know, right. And, <laughs> right. Um, you know, so that it would be like maybe a shorthand. Um, I know in my Montessori training, when we did our observations at the end of every month, we'd make a developmental summary. And that was really useful because it actually made me go back. And then I'd underline all the blue is movement and all the red things were to do with sleep, um, no communication. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter what colors, <laughs> but that was my red was communication. I'm mean, actually 15 years later and you can still remember it. It's so funny. <laughs> it's like it was in my head. But that was really interesting is like, say I had visited the same family for four weeks, then I could see at the beginning of the month, the movement of the baby was like, they were picking up their food like this. And then towards the later in the month, they were kind of trying to do an unrefined pincer. So then I actually kind of can also see development happening at the same time. So that's a really cool thing. Um, so yeah, the observation in the moment, there's then the analysis and then there's maybe even the summary. And taking action to what, to, you know, of what your, what your interpretation of your observation. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Akshata, you wanna unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I, I often like do ask this to uh, other guys, but I want to know your opinion on this topic. Uh, so when the observation comes, we often say like, be like a fly on the wall. Uh, you know, your presence should not be seen and felt by the child. Uh, but often at home uh, atmosphere, uh, since the bonding between the child and the mother is different, I feel like it's very hard for us to draw our energy in and not make a presence, you know, feel. Especially be maybe because we are so busy with everything and as soon as we enter their space, I feel like they can sense our energy. Uh, so uh, what do, do you have any tips for parents? Like how can we, you know, draw our energy in so we don't disturb their work? Well, for one, I will say that that is a beautiful observation in itself, right? Just that, just just being aware of of the 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 difference. 
uh, for me and, 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 you know, Simone, you might have a lot more because you work, you, I know you help parents observe in your class and everything, but to me it would be, um, I know that in the classroom, I would sit down and, you know, with my notepad and, and writing and, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I would say, oh, I'm doing my work. So I think at home we can do the same thing is we can be sitting and writing and, and just be there. And we're in our home with, with our children. It's going to be different. Like we, we can't be a fly on the wall in our home, right? We could put hidden cameras and, you know, be in another room, but that's not. So you can, you know, just sit down and, and say, oh, I'm doing some work. I'm writing things down. That's it. Like, you know, and just be able to, to, to have that mindfulness and, and, and kind of, um, and to me, it's also, you know, meditation of, of having or, or, or some type of, of very, you know, very quick, like self hypnosis. I know I have a trick of, you know, three, two, one. And I, you know, my, when my fingers touch, I'm, I'm, I can just completely calm down and, and be in the present moment. So there's, there's different tricks that we can, we can, you know, train ourselves to be, but just you noticing that I think in itself, that is the beauty of observation right there. Like you've noticed and you've observed something. So you're seeking to, to change that. Yeah. So, um, yes. Um, so I read this beautiful quote and I'm sorry, I don't know where it's from, but it's basically to say that the observer will affect the observation. You know, you know yourself, you can feel someone's looking at you, right? You know, we have that sixth sense. So um, I write, when I'm doing observation in my classroom with the toddlers, usually there's a line that says, such and such looks to S, which is me, you know, every, pretty much every observation. And I'm <laughs> being as neutral as possible. Like you say, I'm sitting there not saying anything, but they know they're being watched. And so then I just make that part of my observation. Interesting. And when they don't look to me, then I think interesting. Um, but it's just an observation itself. Um, like Jean Marie says, I when they always come over to say, what are you doing? And then they want to take their parents' pen and all those kind of things. Then I say, oh, I'm writing down that. Julia is opening the book. And then, and when they know they're the subject of the book, they're usually quite happy with that as well. So, <laughs> or I often I have a journal for them as well. And I saw these gorgeous. Um, oh, I can't, I've followed so many webinars and workshops and things over COVID. I have no idea anymore. <laughs> where from. But basically, um, there was an adult in the classroom observing, and next to her, there was a, a child um, observe, like doing, oh. pretending to do an observation as well. You know, so you're modeling, and it's just, it, it, it doesn't matter in a way. Do you know what I mean? Like, that is the observation. Your child is talking about what you're doing right now. Yeah. And to me, and, and it's funny because you bring up a point. I, you know, how in our training, how the, the, the fact that the child learns so much from observing the other ones and that, that taking time to observe was, was definitely something so important and, and how, you know, we do with the grace and courtesy, we help them understand that we can observe, but we don't interrupt, right? So that's why you often see children with their hands behind their back, just watching you know the, the the older children doing doing work and so observation i think is something that you know is innate in us we're 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 always observing how others are doing things and and so forth so it's just the idea of the not the not judging but <laughs> harder harder said than uh easier said than done and actually, I'm curious what you've heard from other people. What were, what was the general consensus about the observer affecting the observation? Yeah. Okay. So just today we had a, a live call in the conference where I asked this question and the guide in, uh, she suggested we can, before we enter the space, we can take some deep breaths and, you know, calm ourselves down and uh, into, I mean, relax and stop thinking of what we were maybe we had a call or some you right. know we have that heat of the moment or something and just calm ourselves before entering the space um because they can sense if we are anxious or something so that that i felt like it was a good suggestion too and that's but i would love to know how jen does it like 
this. <laughs> that so, is <laughs> so yeah. it's uh, actually, and I can put the link uh, in the email if I remember it, but it was, I think, hypnosis download. And it's just a thing to learn how to do self-hypnosis. And it's really, a, you know, you if you repeat it enough, then after you're, you've kind of trained your brain where it's as simple as three, two, one, and for me, when, you know, when I, the one and the touching of the, the fingers, the index and the thumb just puts me in a state of, of, of calm and I'm in the present moment. And I think that that's what is so important about observation is like, you know, like you said, the, the, the past is the past, the future is not yet. We need to be right here, right now, like our children. Uh, and, and sometimes we, we need extra help. So anything you know if it's if it's three deep breaths if it's you know having a certain mantra whatever you find the techniques that that um help you but I'll, I'll share that with you for me it's been very helpful even in even in like stressful situations where I just need to you know keep my cool when I'm about to confront somebody or something I I just three two one and poof <laughs> so yeah, lovely. And um, awesome. Nishi wrote in the um, chat. That's how I feel about sensory play, sand, rice beans. That's the when we were talking about painting. And mm -hmm. um, Adeline also says painting is the same for me during summer school. Big breath after I observe what happens when I let go. I can later on adjust material and my expectations. At least appreciated the tips for the color coding, the observations when I, we underlined and suggested as well that at the end of each observation to add a reflection. I think that's. A great example. Um, I actually, there's a Simone. I'd like to do a shout out to Adeline. Actually, she has yeah. been our longest standing fan. <laughs> Adeline has been on the Montessori show for a long time before she had children, and she is now has two children uh, and is a Montessori guide. She's now trained. So, thank you, Adeline. Ah! Merci, Adeline. She's <laughs> That is very cool. I do remember when you were pregnant and that's so fun that we're on the call with all these friends yes. who yeah. keep hang, coming exactly. back. Exactly, exactly. Um, there's a direct message one that came to me, a question. So I'll read it out. And it's a good one for you, Jean-Marie, because it's um, your preschool age group. My five and a half year old wants to write everything out now. So for example, she had um, show and tell this morning and wanted to write a speech to present her item. What can I prepare to help encourage or feed that interest? Uh, Having beautiful pens and papers, having, having, you know, having a chalkboard to practice. I, I don't know like what level of, of um, writing she's doing, but I think it's, it's always about giving them proper tools. And uh, as they get older and want to write more, I know there's, you know, we can really have material that is going to, make you want to write if you have a you know beautiful notebook and some some nice pens you're going to want to 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 write so material definitely uh continue reading 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 and and um you know yeah uh just encourage as much as you can and and you want to write a speech yes write a speech and and you know, it's going to be very phonetic at the beginning and, and that's fine. There's no need to correct. For me, it's, it's, it's the process of the creative writing that is the most important. And then also my kids used to sometimes want to dictate like a really long story and they were in a flow. So I actually would write that for them. So it's encouraging the storytelling aspect where they would be held up by trying to write it out themselves. And I found them um, a little while back and I'm just so blessed that I have these beautiful stories like from four or five years old where they definitely um, are now recorded. So really fun. Right, right. Um, so Nisha says, love that. She has a lot of material, but perhaps a writing corner. She loves staplers and making books. Thank you. You're welcome. And also um, we had an old fashioned secondhand typewriter, which I still have. And that was also really fun for kids. Like they like playing on the old typewriters. Um, yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so we have some more questions that came in on the Google. Um, yeah. Should we, I'll, I'll read one uh, for you if you want. Uh, good evening, ladies. What's the advice on dealing with a three-year-old recent interest in TV characters? 
Paw Patrol, Spider-Man, Thomas the Tank, etc. Through interaction with his peers. His friends have some toys figures and he is really interested in them and keeps mentioning them. We are screen free for children families so he has never engaged with these characters on screen but is really interested and drawn to any merchandise we see in the shops or books in the library. We are, so should I continue to steer him back to reality at this point? Is the introduction of concrete figures, toys, alternative education, not familiar with any? Uh, so this is interesting. Um, so for me, it's, it's about, this is the reality. Like these are made up characters that, you know, we show on shows, like there's, there's, that's part of his reality that children are talking about these characters, that there's characters, um, to, to like force it back to more concrete things. I don't know as if it's necessary because this is the reality. I wouldn't go into the fantasy, but definitely, uh, you know, you can talk about the, the, what the stories are, what his imagination is telling you what the stories are. And it's fascinating because my daughter did exactly the same thing. We moved here when she was two years old. And then she went to a little preschool as a three-year-old and would come home with all these stories of, I forget what they were. They were, um, there was, there were four characters and different colors and all this and all her friends, that's what they played because that's what they watched. And we had never watched this show, but she knew everything. And that was fine. That was just part of her reality. It doesn't mean that you have to go by them. It doesn't mean you have to know the stories and so forth. It's just, oh yes, these are characters that, you know, TV people have made and, and that's fine. Like I wouldn't, you know, be too, too preoccupied with it. Simone, do you have? Yeah, so Oliver's friend had Thomas the Tank Engine things. And so when we went to their house, Oliver was obsessed and did not want to leave their house because he got to play with all the Thomas the Tank Engine things. Um, and we didn't have it at our house. He had a Ikea I train that's non-merchandised and you know, so um, I kind of, you can't avoid it because it is in other people's homes, but I also try not to make it too big a deal because otherwise it was going to be like a, the, the chocolate, you know, that you say they can't have. Um, but we also didn't buy it for our house. We go, oh yeah, that's Paw Patrol. Oh yeah. And I just, like, if they spot it, I just name them. I don't need me to buy it. And if they really want you to say, oh, write it on a list of things we might get one day or like, you know, that you might like to ask for. And it just probably that one would never come back up to the top of my list, you know, of things that they needed. Right. But acknowledging, yeah, you really like that Paw Patrol thing. I'll write it in my notebook. Um, that might be as far yeah. as I go with it. So I think it's keeping it, um, it's going to be in society, but you don't have to bring it into your home. Um, the other thing, because I think it's a slippery slope. They just be, can become so... That's why we try and avoid it in Montessori as well is because they only then play about these characters and things as opposed to mum um, is cooking um, with and, you know, like just all of the daily life things that they will experience instead. And when you have a very concrete base in reality, then in the six to 12 years, you have this amazing imagination because you can build an amazing tower because you've seen every Eiffel Tower and tower, the highest tower in this city and that city. And then you can create your own tower, right? But if you've only limited to what someone else has given you um, in a cartoon show, then you'll only create from that experience. And, so and that it's, yeah, cool. and it's interesting because also like the whole merchandise things of toys. I know that uh, John, John Kim Payne in Simplicity Parenting talks a lot about that of how those toys already have a story that is not yours. It's not your imagination. Like it, the, the toy is dictating the, the, the story and it, it's not, you know, it's like you say, it's not letting them use their own imagination. So definitely stay away. There is one question about this from uh, Akshata about uh, that parents might feel that their children are, are left out um, I say, I say, I call BS, sorry, but I <laughs> just, they're not left out there. It's just, it's, it's, to me, it's like, it's part again of their imagination. And, um, 
they they interpret what they want from it like i don't know as if they feel left out and and it's interesting because and this is very personal but i have never been a big tv watcher and and i have moved from one continent to another many times so i've always missed uh, and I, I and I should not say miss, but I I was never in on the conversations of different shows, and and to be honest, they bore me. Like I don't, you know, and I just I talk about other things, but people will go into details about the show that they're watching and this and this and that. And yes, at times I felt like I was not part of the conversation because I didn't know what was going on. But at the same time, it wasn't that interesting. Like I. I didn't feel like I was missing out because it was like, they're just talking about a TV show. So I think it's your, your perspective on it, you know, really. I've got two things that I yeah. could add that as well mm -hmm. is that um, there was a beautiful podcast interview I did with Rumi Montessori mm -hmm. and she was saying that her son, like they were just going to be screen free for a couple of years and then they, decided to keep extending it. And then they kind of kept extending it around six years old. They explained to him what it does to your brain. And he decided, yeah, I don't want screens either. But she said that actually the kids wanted to play with him because he was so imaginative with all the other original things that he was coming up with. So I thought that was really beautiful. Um, and then I would say in the six to 12 age group, when um, being part of a group and the herd is very important, then um, Sue Palmer has wrote a book called Toxic Childhood, and it, it's actually a very, it sounds like a terrible book, but it's like what the world's doing to our kids and what we can do about it. So it's very, you know, this is the bad thing, but these are the things you can do. And at that point, it, the book's written around 2000. So it doesn't refer to iPads and screens, but basically TV shows, right? So your kids are hearing um, about things in the playground. And her advice is like, if you're going to have some screen time, allow them a small amount so they understand a little bit of what's going on. Like if your kids never played Minecraft, they might feel really left out. So it's like being very conscious with sensible use, you know, allowing them a little bit so they know a little bit what's going on, but you not in this like hours of passive entertainment. So that was also another perspective as well. It's like rather than being the weird kid who doesn't have a screen is that they've had a small amount to understand a little bit what's going on. So that's another perspective, just yeah. throwing it out there for anyone who. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued as to what this past year has done for our children, because there are many, many children who have had to do distant learning at very, very young age when I would prefer they not be in front of a screen and here they were, you know, having to. Um, so I'm just... It's, it's, it's going to be fascinating to to see what that how that trickles down um, i think it's really interesting nisha's written in the chat i get that too when i chose to offer only healthy snacks and foods to my girls no sugary drinks and things so they say to me that my girls will feel left out um and um dalani Daliani, sorry, I'm working on it. <laughs> my name pronunciation is not my best today. Um, about food, I did explain the reason and the real impact on their health and the result of sugar on their brain very young. And they did understand that very well. So yes. um, yeah, everyone, you have to be, basically be comfortable with your family choices because exactly. you're going to question them a lot. And six to 12 year olds will really ask like, they're allowed to do this and we're allowed to do that. And if you just stay in your lane, like this is what's important to our family and make the decisions together, then you're on a good thing. Yeah, and, and for, for, for us, we are screen-free family, and I made a commitment that I would not spend and make any type of financial investment in video games. So all of the you know, latest, greatest Xboxes and Wiis and all of this, I, I never did. And there was a time when my son was pretty upset with me that it was unfair, that, you know, all his friends had them and all this. And that's where we get to explain our family values. Because for me, I would much prefer spending my financial power in travel. And so my children have traveled all over the world. And that's what that's where that's my value. And so I just told them, I said, yeah, they all have video games, but have they gone to seen the, you know, pyramids in, in Mexico and in Egypt and, and so on and so forth? No. So it's about 
being true to what's important to you is, is the most important. Okay, I've got another question here from Ennis and it says, observations, how much do you do per day at home? Sometimes you are observing just one thing um, of many the child is doing unless you are 24 seven observing. How do you know as part of the observation when the child is struggling in a positive way versus approaching frustration and need to step in? Oh, I love those questions, that's brilliant. That is, that is a yeah, beautiful question. And to me, that is that muscle of observation that gets trained where you're going to be, you know, more and more in tune because you are observing, you are going to be able to detect when, when you can see that it is a, a true struggle and where you can just say, you know, can I help you with something? Or I see you're having a hard time. Do you, you know, do you need some help? Sometimes they'll say yes. Sometimes they'll say no, but at least you are, you are there, you are observing, uh, you are seeing it. Um, as far as how much per day, there is no should or exact. I think to me, it's, it's, you know, what, what works for you. It might be two minutes here, two minutes there. It might be sit down for 30 minutes. It really is how your flow of the day is going, how easy it is for you. Um, I don't think there is any particular, um, any particular way. Um, and do you know, yes, yeah, so the struggling versus positive way that I think is just going to be part of you getting to know uh, your child and how they approach difficulties and so forth. Um, so I think that's it. And I don't know where Simone disappeared to. Simone, did you disappear? I'm back. I'm back. I'm so sorry about that. My <laughs> puppy started barking. So I quickly opened the back door because we have a tiny little like square meter room in case she needs to be. <laughs> gave us food. There you go. Um, I do have some things I wanted to add. Yes, um, please. Because there was something, so she said, sometimes you're observing just one thing of the many the child is doing unless you're 24 seven observing. And actually that's what I like to do sometimes. Like, so sometimes in our classes, we do running record observations, which is when I'm just describing exactly in a stream of consciousness, exactly what I see. Like the child walks to the shelf, they take the tray, they're holding it in two hands. This is how they're carrying it. And I describe the whole sequence. And other times I say to the parents, let's just focus on communication today and look then in lots of detail at communication because communication can be the words they're saying, the sounds they're saying, the um, body language, you know, we're looking with and hearing and, you know, the tone of their voice and those kind of things. So I do sometimes like to zoom in on one particular area because you'll get much more detail on that that day. Um, that's what I wanted to answer about that. How much to do per day, kind of like we were talking about before is that you can um, sometimes be writing and sometimes you're just, yeah, then the most of the rest of the time is you're observing on the go and then just noticing when you're moving to judgment as opposed to um, looking more factually at the situation. And what I like to say to parents too, is like when we do it in class and the classroom's nice and calm and we're writing in our observation journals and we haven't got like the cook, dinner cooking or the doorbell going or, you know, all the other things, we're basically like practicing meditation on a retreat. Yeah. We've got no external kind of thing. So practice in those situations so that then when your child's having a meltdown or, you know, everything's going haywire, you're able to say, oh, you, they're lying on the ground, they're kicking their legs, their arms moving this way and that way and their head's rolling as opposed to why are they throwing another tantrum, you know, so we're kind of practicing that's like beginner level versus advanced level. So don't worry if you can't be doing observation and remaining completely calm at all times when they're in the moment of the tantrum, but you're building up to that, which actually leads into a really good question from Jenia, which came through as a private message on the call, which says, can you observe tantrums, emotional events as to see what is driving it, um, patterns, how you can help? And if so, any tips on how you stay calm? Do you want to start with that one? Uh, so any tips on how to stay calm is uh, observing yourself as to know what calms you. So I think uh, it's important to know what is your go to things to calm down. Some people it might be getting a drink of water, some people it might be splashing cold water on your face, uh, a few breaths. Uh, I have this, you know, self hypnosis technique, it's, it's really about you 
<clears throat> having the tools, but be thinking of them ahead of time. And if it helps, even write them down. Because I think sometimes when we're in the thick of it, we forget that we can calm ourselves. So if we have a reminder somewhere of, um, and those of you who know positive discipline, you know, when we flipped our lid, where where sometimes we're 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 lost, like oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? So if we have somewhere we can look to and go, oh yes, take a deep breath, like it just it reminds you. So sometimes we just need some extra help. So that would be the tips of of you know what calms you is is knowing first what are your go-to things for me it's walking outside i'm i'm lucky enough to be able to you know walk into my garden and sometimes i just need to go look at the sky and just and that that calms me so whatever is is your thing um and then uh when you observe tantrum emotional zone how you can help and if so any tips so, so there it's going to be again about observing, you know, if what time of day is it? Uh, is it right before a meal time? Is it before a nap time? Like, are there are there patterns in the day that are going to indicate that maybe there's low blood sugar and that, you know, that's why that's why they lose it. I, you know, I'm I've observed in myself that if I don't eat, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty, you know, unhappy person. <laughs> so now I know <laughs> I go and get my nuts, you know, but it's, it's, it's those things. So with our children, it's the same thing. So to, to observe that also, and then sometimes we can kind of be there to, to prevent it. If we, if we know that there are certain things that set them off or that, um, you know, maybe there's a certain sound, a certain temperature, a certain smell, who knows, like we, we, we become more aware, because when we're observing, we're, we're, we're wanting to be in tune with all of the senses, like it's not only our visual sense, it's, it's what are we feeling in our bodies, what are we hearing, smelling, you know, all of this is important. And so the child, it's the same thing, if we can notice what is, you know, what is the dot that is connecting all of these are, are going to help you also maybe be one step ahead of the game uh, for the next day? Yeah, Alone I love something. all yeah. of that. Mm. I love all of that. And I think that um, observation itself is how you stay calm, right? Yes. So you're basically like, um, yeah, like you are, like I'm saying, that's the advanced situation though, when you're able to stay calm, even when your child's having a hard time. Plus, John Murray always told me, they're not giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. So um, when we keep thinking that this is not my, like if I can stay like their rock and I've, I've done lots of different things. I wrote a whole post about staying calm, but like there was, um, I heard the word equanimity and at the time I didn't know what equanimity was. And then a friend explained, it's like being in a marshmallow where like if you're in traffic, that you basically have a buffer between you and all the traffic and everything else that's going along. So then I just kind of pictured as a parent, you know, being in a marshmallow so that the child's emotions kind of can't enter the marshmallow. Anyway, I did a whole advent of calm. I've got a whole lot of resources about calm. So I'll post them in the show notes um, because yeah, that's one thing I can, I feel like I can help people. With and that, that. And, that's, and that's the thing is, 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 I think to me, it's important as parents that we continue to learn about ourselves and to, to, to learn new, new tricks of how to stay calm. I mean, if, if imagining yourself as a marshmallow is going to help you, then that's, that's the one, right? And it, and it's, and it's so important for me, I just, you know, I imagine like a, um, kind of some, you know, light around me, like energy, and it's, it's, it's a shield around me. Uh, so, you know, di different things for, for, for different people, but I think it's just important to tune in with, with remembering what calms you, what do you, what do you enjoy, what is going to relax you, and to always, always remember to take good care of yourself. The, the self-care is also very important. If you've had a hard day, like, you know, you don't need to fold all the laundry, go take a bath or go take a hot shower. Like, you know, it's, it's important to, to 
take a moment to ask yourselves, like, what do I need right now? Because we need to be, you know, at the top of our game all the time, 24 hour seven. So, so yeah. I think it's also that's part of like, what do we do to preventively, you know, beforehand, you know, so that's the things that fill your cup, the meditation, maybe for some people, the walks for you, Jean-Marie, all those things. They're the things we can do to make sure we're in a good space for most of the day. And then there's the keeping calm in the like, more difficult moments. And then there's like, when we lost it, how do we make amends as well? This is just, and it's a beautiful apology. It's just like, I'm human. And actually the best way my child's going to learn to um, apologize is when they see that I said, I'm so sorry, I should not have shouted at you. What I should have done is to do it. Um, and what I could have said is, and you you get to do over, and then they'll learn. Hey, can I do a do over too? <laughs> I exactly. really got that exactly. I'm really sorry what I said earlier. Yeah, and that's a beautiful point. Is is you know noticing, observing that you've 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 stepped out of line. You didn't you didn't react the way that you would like to react, and that to to just admit it, to observe it, and to say, oh my gosh, I'm I'm going to try to do better next time is so, so important because our children are observing our every move. And if they observe us being kind to ourselves and learning from our mistakes, we're doing them an immense favor. So yes, very good point. Wonderful. I see that we're nearly at the top of the hour. And I was, you're going on an aeroplane tomorrow, so we won't keep you over time today. Um, <laughs> um, but I is just, there any- there, there, was, there, there are some questions though. I did want to just touch in the chat. Uh, yeah. There is one, Marina uh, says, do you have any advice on how to connect with Montessori families in your local community? My son is 19 months and we are not at a Montessori school yet. Um, so I don't know where you are, uh, you know, in the world and everything, but I know here in, in the US, there's um, things like Meetup, they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, a social, so I know with, with COVID and all that, that all got calmed down, but I know for myself, like I used Meetup and I would do Meetup groups for Montessori parents or for parents who wanted to know about Montessori. So there, um, if you are on social media, Facebook, I think is, is pretty good with that, with, with community building. You just say, I'm new in town and would love to meet up with families. There's a lot of uh, like nature groups also, um, things like that is, is, would be, um, would be a way. So, um, let us know where you are from and maybe there's somebody here on the show that is from where you are. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, safe journey. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I am off to, to France where my family resides and where, I hope to see my daughter that I haven't seen in two years. And let me tell you, for a mama's heart, two years is really a long time. So I am like, so <laughs> on the edge of my chair, <laughs> wanting to see my, my firstborn who has been uh, studying in Scotland. And because of all of the um, pandemic and travel restriction, we haven't been able to see her. So. I am super excited. So there. Super fun. Yes. Well, um, keep an eye out because Jean-Marie, even from her lovely trip in France, is going to be launching her parenting toolkit again. Yes. So we'll um, put a link in the show notes so that you can be the first to be told when that's live. Yes. Um, it's fun to see some of the people from the Monster Retreat on here as well, which we're currently doing. And um, yeah, you're welcome yes, to join. And, I, and, and, and I'm in there, but I'm this week was not a slow week for me, unfortunately. So. <laughs> <laughs> I will join. I will join once I'm settled and, and look forward to, to meeting everybody there. So wonderful summer to everybody. And we did set a date for our next uh, Montessori show, which will be September 24th. So it's the last Friday of September. Um, and we wish you all a beautiful summer. Take it slow, take good care of yourselves um, and enjoy your beautiful children.
And, and thank, thank you for, for being joining here. us yeah. and your beautiful questions. Because without you, there's no more story show. I'll thank you, Elisa, for the heart. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful heart. Beautiful. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. See you soon.